Allow me to introduce you to the panelists. James Crabtree is a writer, journalist, and author. He is currently an associate professor of practice at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and a senior fellow at the School Center on Asia and Globalization. His first book, The Billionaire Raj, A Journey Through India's New Gilded Age, was published in July 2018. Mukund Padbanabhan is editor of The Hindu. He worked for the magazine Sunday in Kolkata and The Indian Express before joining The Hindu in 1997. He curates two festivals of theatre and music, the Hindu Theatre Fest and the Hindu November Fest on behalf of his newspaper group. Priya Sagal is a senior executive editor at NewsX Channel where she anchors two political shows, The Round Table and Cover Story. Her book, The Contenders, came out in November 2018. A political journalist for nearly three decades, Priya has worked at Sunday, Outlook and India Today. Suki Kim is a South Korean-born American investigative journalist, novelist, and the only writer ever to have lived undercover in North Korea for immersive journalism. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Without You There Is No Us, Undercover Among the Sons of North Korea Elite. Her first novel, The Interpreter, won a Penn Open Book Award and was a finalist for a Penn Hemingway Prize. Ravi Shankar Etat is a Delhi-based journalist, political cartoonist, graphic designer, and author. In 1996, Etat published his first book of short stories titled The Scream of the Dragon Flies. He now is a columnist and consulting editor with the New Indian Express. Moderating this session is Narayan Lakshman, who is an associate editor at The Hindu and an author. His doctoral research explored the politics of poverty elevation in India and was later published as a book titled Patrons of the Poor, Caste, Politics and Policy Making in India in March 2011. I hand over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. I think that made my job a bit easy. I was going to otherwise introduce all of you, so that's great. Um, <laughs> save me some time. Uh, okay, so we have a both, uh, interesting and very serious topic today, which is the media under threat. Um, and so far as freedom of expression goes, uh, it, nowhere does it matter more than in a complex, pluralistic democracy such as India's. Uh, and the relevance of uh, freedom of expression in the context of a free press uh, was best summed up by none other than Mohandas Gandhi, who said in 1940, uh, freedom of speech and pen is the foundation of Swaraj. If the foundation stone is in danger, you have to exert the whole of your might in order to defend that single stone. And I was also thinking of this wonderful uh, Urdu couplet that Arun Chauri shared with us yesterday, where he said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, uh, that the hunter may be poised with a strong arrow waiting to, to be unleashed on the flying bulbul, and the gardener may be poised with the clippers about to cut the, a flower, but the bird's beautiful song and the flower's fragrance shall continue until they no longer can. So this is the spirit of courage uh, which... Maybe, maybe all that the media in India today can rely on, and yet we must ask ourselves uh, what threats uh, the media faces when we know that these, when we know that this is this courage is all that we have. So, in that backdrop, um, I'd like to invite each of our panelists, maybe starting with James, uh, to give us your own sense of uh, do you, how, to what extent do you feel the media is under threat, uh, and what are the specific threats. Uh, very good. Let me be fairly brief. I'll say three things. So I live in Singapore, and I suppose, although I think we will talk throughout this panel about the ways in which media in India is to some degree under threat, um, it's worth at least pausing for a minute and, and looking at India within the context of Asia. Um, given the choice between the free-spirited, rambunctious media that you have in India and the much more cowed and deferential controlled media that you have in much of the rest of East Asia, I would take the Indian media every time. And so I think it's important to begin from a position of realizing actually that, you know, although India comes relatively low on indexes of media freedom, the lived experience of the daily media here is, to my degree, much better than in most of the rest of Asia. So that's point one. Um, the second thing is, I mean, I, I think there is a real sense that uh, journalists in India, in India and those who operate in India are under threat from corporate interests. And I, I say this, I think, as the only person on this panel 
who has had the honor to join the large and growing band of journalists who has been sued by Anil Ambani. Um, the, the details of which I'm not going to go into in any great detail, but it is clear, as I have discovered to my extreme cost over the last year, that, uh, that the Indian legal system uh, is used uh, as a, a, a kind of whip with which to beat uh, media institutions and individual journalists in a way that is uh, you know, little short of crazy. Um, I, I think we'll talk a good deal in the panel about the threat from religious extremism, so I'll let others deal with that. Let me put a couple of other threats on the table. I mean, it seems to me that there are at least three threats to kind of sensible, investigative, balanced, moderate journalism, one of which is television and, and the kind of tone of Indian television news. In my book, The Billionaire Raj, I have a chapter on Arnab Goswami, and although there's a sort of real spirit to that turn in Indian television news, um, there's clearly a lot of problems that come with that. The second is social media, where I think it is clear, not just in India, but across Asia, that if you drop social media onto contexts where there are deep social divisions and where there are some weaknesses in media institutions, that this is very problematic. And then the final is economic, where I used to work for the Financial Times and I have seen firsthand the whirlwind that has been wrecked across the American and European media by the onset of social media. And that, I think, is going to be felt even more forcefully in this part of the world. And I do worry for the, the economic health of the heritage print institutions, apart from the Hindu, which I'm sure will be fine. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, the perspective that I can give on uh, the threats that the media faces, uh, I can give the example of the three worlds that I'm familiar with that I have covered. And that begins with, I live in America, and um, the American media is definitely under threats under the current President Trump, where the media has become a propaganda tool that's constantly being used by the President and also constantly being targeted as fake news. So um, that, that's a case of the media now becoming a tool for the president, either to believe or disbelieve. And I think that that brings it straight close to the second example, which is uh, South Korea. And I've um, done a recent investigative feature on the Singapore summit. That's a perfect example, Singapore summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, which mostly now the perception is that things are getting better. Koreas are uh, becoming friends. There's a peace on the Korean peninsula. But if you were to ask anybody, why do you think that? It's because they've seen it on television, presidents shaking hands, or South Korean president shaking hands with a North Korean president. Beyond that, what else do you really know? You know, like, and I think that's the role of what the media has done. Media has presented this image. When I went to Singapore, there were 3,000 journalists in Singapore covering the summit. And we were all in this big media room and we were watching it from television. <laughs> We've flown in from around the world to be watching this summit on television and everybody firing stories off to their own newspaper stations around the world. And because newspapers and television have now paid their journalists all the way to Singapore to cover this story, they had to come up with some story when there was really no story. So I did a piece, actually a small piece for the New, New Yorker about how the journalists had no story, they started interviewing each other. And, <laughs> and that's when there's just utterly no story. So I think that's a second example of when the media is used to actually push the propaganda of governments involved in this story, which is North Korea, United States under Trump, and South Korea, who's behind the scene. Now, the third example, obviously, is North Korea, where there's absolutely lack of freedom, absolutely no freedom of media, all the media is used to perpetuate the news about the great leader. There is no news except the great leader information. Now, a place like that, because there is no media, you have no perspective, and now the myth of the great leader is larger than ever, and the only thing that can save, not save, but at least a little light of hope 
to bring some truth to that world is investigative journalism. So I do believe in the hope of deeper investigative journalism to go be behind really the image. But so in that, I don't know if that's a threat, but I think we need that more than ever. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, the media is, is certainly under extreme abuse. I mean, you know, of that there is no doubt. I mean, I've, I've never, never heard, heard as many words used for against the media as I do now. It comes from government, it comes from sections of the public, it comes on social media. How threatened we are, I think, is a, is a function of, you know, which group you work for and, and uh, you know, what maybe the owners of media houses say or what individual, how individuals are cowed down. I just want to take off from James. I mean, James compared India to, uh, uh, you know, other parts of East Asia. But compare us to our own region, South Asia. We've been unique in this respect. I think we've enjoyed over the years, uh, despite, you know, an aberration, maybe a couple of years, you know, you had the emergency clampdown. We've had a much more lively, vibrant press than uh, the others have had. And I think we need to be grateful for that. I think it's a function of, of the strength of our democracy more than anything else. The second issue is, it's tempting to think back and believe that there was some kind of golden age that existed. I sometimes go back to the papers that we, you know, that the Hindu itself, you know, in maybe the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, uh, early 70s, well, right through the 70s, and, you know, what kind of investigation was done there? What kind of scandal happened? I mean, you can, you can count them on your fingertips, and, you know, most of them, like, you know, played out maybe, you know, here and there in Parliament at most. Uh, there was nothing. In fact, uh, this uh, English journalist who worked for the Guardian of then married in India, David Cameron, in his book, An Indian Summer, talks of the press of being uh, not a censored press, but a cooperative press. It was almost as if for the first two or three de decades, we believed that we were part of some kind of nation-building project. It was only in the 80s, post-emergency, I think we came to life. And I think the larger issue is, where, where do we stand now? I have, I mean, I still believe, like him, we are noisy, we are vibrant, and uh, we reflect a diversity of views. I think the reason why some of this debate comes up is, what, what has happened as well is, we have, unlike in the past, we have, certain news outlets and others like batting seemingly openly for government. And that seems like, you know, they seem like a threat to other sections of the media. And I think this becomes, uh, you know, a factor in everyone's life. And I think it sort of dominates the conversation uh, that we are under threat. I mean, I, for myself, I would just make two, two extra points. I think sometimes we debate this issue of you know, a threatened media in forums and between people who are not threatened at all. Uh, as, I mean, as the editor of a publication that has uh, many boots on the grounds in, in district level uh, places and, and smaller towns, I don't even think we debate this in terms of where the real chilling effect happens. Think of a reporter at a district level and, and the people he has to deal with when he fights. It is real, the chilling effort. The other issue is, I think as publications, and I think this is true of all publications, uh, the further you, I mean, the power that you, or the stories that you're really worried about is, is or you'd pr probably go uh, two or three times is, is the one that can affect you, you know, who controls the police, <laughs> where you publish. It's that kind of thing that, that has the real chilling effect. So. Overall, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I well believe that uh, there's much more abuse, there's much more threat in that, that respect than I've ever seen before. Uh, but I don't see a, a media that is cowed down. I think that is, uh, uh, I think, uh, 
uh, that's, that's where I disagree with, with the general perception, I think, of this. But are we fighting back, just to take off from your point, because, you know, there is a sense that this government may be losing its sheen, which is why we see more and more stories against the government now than we did in 2014 or even, you know, halfway through the government. But having said that, is the media under threat? Well, give me one other reason why in this age of vibrant and noisy media, where every television channel, 24 by 7 news, tries to break four stories at the same time. You have a breaking on ticker, you are breaking on graphics, infographics, top bands, four or five different stories trying to catch everybody's attention. But these same loud, noisy TV channels take a break for every half an hour, once a week, every Sunday to broadcast a radio address, a monologue. What other reason could there be for that? So yes, there is pressure. Is it pressure? Uh, there, there is, of course, one reason for it is the ownership model of the channels. You know, there is the corporate pressure. There is pressure for advertisements. Maybe we need to relook at the business model of the uh, of the uh, media because you know we are the fourth principle of uh, democracy. Uh, the executive, the judiciary, the legislative don't have to depend on funding and ads, so they can function with some degree of freedom. Our corporate bosses, in that sense, do have their own restrictions. Yes, the establishment has always been threatened by the media and there have been various degrees. Emergency we all know about, so I won't go into that. I'll talk about the immediate past, the UPA government and the current Modi government. During the UPA government, what used to happen is individual cabinet ministers, leaders who felt that we were taking them on strongly or felt threatened by us used to call up the editors and complain about themselves. What is happening now is that it's become institutionalized. Maybe because there is a one-man centric uh, uh, organization at the center, you know, the whole government is being led by one man. I mean, for demonetization, you're not going to criticize the finance minister. For Ujwala, you're not going to, uh, the, for the petroleum scheme, you're not going to criticize the petroleum minister. Decisions are taken by one man. He is very happy to take the credit for it, so then he should also take the flag for it. That is something that he is not very happy about. So yes, we are under threat. There is uh, a lot of criticism, but uh, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, three things, a couple of things have changed, which is, of course, the rise of social media, which is where even if the mainstream media feels, uh, you know, that they cannot make the voice heard or feel, or feel that, you know, there are some orders that are saying you cannot carry a story, that story does find a way out. It finds a way out on social media. You also get a lot of trolls on social media, which is why I think that is maybe the government's answer to the social media. We've also seen a lot of websites coming up. Digital media is one answer to the media threat. So maybe the future is going to be not mainstream. It's already happening. We are seeing more and more individual voices, digital platforms coming up that are actually taking on this threat. So yes, there is a threat, but we are fighting back. Hi, good, good evening. Um, I am going to go off on a tangent on this. It was very seen that the media is under threat, makes us believe that we're victims you guys believe that victims, we are not victims, they were pretty powerful. Like a crisis of credibility, what we are having is a crisis of access. What is access used for? Access ideally should be used for information, information to be put in the right context, information to be exposed. But today, I am sorry to say that a lot of journalists use access for, you know, getting land deals done, getting defense deals done, getting various things done, which I think is a growing trend, that's number one. Number two, there is a general perception that the journalist is privileged. Why should he be privileged? I mean, the whole perception that the journalist is privileged comes from the fact that he himself thinks that, okay, I'm close to this minister, I'm close to so-and-so, so I am powerful. Now, why should journalists get quotas for, you know, government accommodation? Why should they get quotas for, you know, land deals? I mean, I know people who got petrol pumps a lot of them. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. So, threat actually comes from within. That's one. And the second is a proprietor. I mean, one guy I really, really remember very, very fondly is Arun, Arun Puri. And uh, both Priya and I have worked for India today. I worked in India many, many years ago. The thing with Arun was that when Arun really strongly believed in something, he would, he would really stick with it, right? But you could argue with him. And sometimes it would defend into like screaming and shouting matches. You know, like, they could hear from the ins outside what is going on inside. But the fact is that if you were able to convince Arun, no, this is what it is, and you stood by what he said, you say, okay, eventually. He said, okay, go with it. But today, what do proprietors do? They influence the journalists. They promote journalists who have access to power, who can maybe get them, try get them Rajya Sabha tickets, or try get them, you know, land to kind of do non-journalistic, you know, related activities. So between the proprietor and the journalist, yes, we are absolutely under threat. 
the threat comes from within. It goes much, much beyond the Modi government, much behind, much previously into history. But yes, uh, we survived the emergency. We'll survive this too. So we're good. Uh, thank you all for those comments. So, uh, I'd I mean, there were some pretty strong thre uh, threads that came out of that, and I'd just like to pick up on a few of them. So I guess, Mukund, responding to your point and also some of the things Priya said, um, there certainly there has been a change in the way the media operated in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and it is now. But similarly, I guess the question is, has the, the nature of the threat also changed? Has that beast also evolved? And so instead of looking at one large block of suppression that comes from the government against the media or keeps the media suppressed, uh, are we looking at sort of decentralized threats against the media? And of course, we all know there's a whole group of lo different laws that are used. Obviously, the first being a criminal defamation. Um, and then you have 124A, sedition. And then you have the hate speech laws, which are uh, 153A and 295A, uh, which are slightly different because they tend to be used even by private groups, you know, maybe caste and religious groups who object and this feeling of being, your religious feelings being outraged. So we got, what I mean is, instead of coming just from the government, you have threats now uh, which challenge the media's freedom of expression coming uh, you know, from the state level down to the district level all the way up to the, the federal government level. So how do you respond to that? Is that a question of legal reform? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, I mean, the focus in the media on when it comes to laws has largely been around criminal defamation and you know the argument is that uh, criminal defamation has doesn't exist in the west and then there's criticism of the supreme court judgment upholding it and so on but in reality <clears throat> uh, if you're looking at it as uh, in terms of just a chilling effect uh, this is a piece of legislation thanks to the way the courts function that i don't think um, you know, it's not at the top of our heads when we do this. Uh, simply because it takes years uh, for anything to get heard. There's one hearing which you have to go to and then it, it doesn't happen. And we don't have a very well-developed law of torts. So unlike Britain. Now, Britain <clears throat> doesn't have a, a criminal uh, a defamation law, but it is the libel capital of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, it. The, so to me, at least as it functions, though I think it's a very bad law, it shouldn't be on the statute books, it's not that much of an inhibiting issue, uh, this law of criminal defamation. I think quite rightly you pointed out to 153A and 295, which is really a kind of egalitarian, the latter one, a kind of egalitarian blasphemy law, if you like. These have also been used by governments. Um, the statement, for instance, had a 153A case for what they published. Um, and 295A. So they have on occasion been used. And you know, a government doesn't have to use it. Uh, it can prod someone into using it. And I think there have been instances. Of, well, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's not, uh, not, I mean, that's a different, that's defamation. But um, so I think these two, and I'm surprised that there is not a stronger body of opinion that's actually called for these laws either to be repealed, uh, they're all colonial era laws, or to be read, you know, or to be read down in some way. The entire media focus in my, in my view should, or at least the media focus in my view should shift a little. But a criminal defamation def has been upheld, I mean. Yeah. It's gone the other way. No, I'm saying the media focus when it protests against, um, I think, bad media laws. Uh, maybe if it, you know, the, I'm saying the almost the entire focus is on criminal defamation. I think some of that, some of that attention should shift to uh, these two sections of the IPC, the 153A and 295A, because these are 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 are, are really bad, uh, and and they're subjective. They essentially, you know, operate in in a comp they're they're like offend of you know laws that offend. And who takes offense and, and what constitutes offense are essentially subjective uh, definitions. To, to my mind, they're like uh, the law of contempt can be used only by the courts, but this gives almost like a law of 
a contempt kind law in the hands of people. So I think this is, this really, both these uh, provisions need to go. Uh, so also, Suki, one thing you mentioned, uh, which is, you know, the media sometimes gets used uh, by, uh, for propaganda and, and things like that. Um, that comes from sort of, is it from the opacity of the government as such? Like you were saying, the Singapore summit. It's like, you guys maybe didn't even, weren't even told ahead of time what to expect and what the meeting would entail and whether there'd be, say, a, a press statement or something. But if you look at the continental United States, uh, it's quite different to what Mukundu is saying here, which is there is not that much opacity. Like, Donald Trump may have these press conferences where he yells at people and he is pushing his propaganda through Twitter. Uh, but uh, there is a healthy back and forth and there are new stories being dug out, whether about Russia or, you know, the Russian collusion question or other things. I mean, I think that it is very interesting because we're talking about threat. And I think sometimes threat is good for advancement. So I think because in America, what I find really striking is the whole tweet, Donald Trump's Twitter. I believe tweets are, is it 32 characters? Um, the exact number of words you can use in a tweet is a really a short sentence. And it's a very catchy advertisement kind of a sentence when you think about it. And they really remind me of North Korea. Because when you go to North Korea, it's a country where there's absolutely nothing, no freedom for its citizens, um, where citizens are not allowed to go anywhere, read anything, listen to anything, learn anything except the great leader. Every street corner, every building, every room, would have a slogan by the great leader. And those are, I think, just about the same size as the tweet, Twitter. <laughs> so it's working. What's really sad, though, because when you get so conditioned, um, in every room, you just have this one sentence talking about how great the great leader is. They're usually never that sophisticated or complicated. Very simple sentence, how great leader is so great. And Donald Trump's tweets are like that. They're never complicated. So I think that they stick in people's general masses' mind. And you have this great investigation that's coming out from the Washington Post, New York Times, on what's really happening. Do people really care? That's the sad part of it. I mean, I think that then we can talk about the next generation. How are they going to bring the real news to, for people to pay attention to it? New York Times did an incredible investigation on Donald Trump's financial status and, and actually what's really behind his finance, people read that, but the news got buried because there were so many shocking tweets happening that day. So I think that maybe the difference is for the public to be educated or care enough to pay attention to the real news because these are powerful advertisements, right? I mean, because we are, that's what capitalism does. And I think that's the drawback of capitalism, where you begin to, I don't know if Shake Shack, for example, the hamburger brand has hit India. It, for example, that's, I mean, it's just a hamburger. But somehow their advertisement has been so amazing. In South Korea, people stay up waiting for the opening of the first store. I think people waited for eight hours out in cold to have, taste the first burger. And all it was was this American burger that, I mean, it's okay. <laughs> but their advertisement was so amazing that I think that it just, it was attractive to people. And I think that's kind of what's happening with news, the media. Maybe that's the threat. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, there's, it also sort of links to the other thing that came out of what James said and Ravi as well, which is part of the threat maybe comes from within. And I think, Suki, you were saying that in the U.S., the media has pushed back quite strongly against Trump. And to me, there's definite contrast to the way Indian media houses behave. And I, I don't know about, uh, well, Singapore is a totally different case. <laughs> but um, I, I guess, is, is it real that, is it a real threat that, you know, media proprietors uh, and media houses are getting corporatized? And it's not so much, it, it, partly it's lawsuits, but partly it's also about self-censorship because you know, it gives you access, it gives you, it gives you power, it gives you, you know, physical assets even. I mean, I think it's a funny picture in yeah. the West at the moment where you have a, um, you have a sort of two levels of story. So at the, 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 the elite media are, in, are somewhere between, are almost entering a kind of golden age where the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, the FT, the Economist, the sort of the real top tier of global brands 
are actually now doing pretty well. They're all reasonably profitable. They all have growing subscription bases. They're weaning themselves off advertising. And particularly in the United States, although you can argue the toss about how well the investigative media performed its function during the election campaign of Trump versus Hillary, clearly now the New York Times and the Washington Post are going through a kind of golden age. And you know, I, I'm not sure it would be, I don't know, I don't want to sort of compare that to the Indian media because the contexts are very different. But the level below that is still bleeding. Um, you know, the number of people working as journalists in the United States um, has been, has gone down by a third in the last 10 or 15 years. It's probably the same at the regional and local level. And I think that is the, the real danger in India as well, that this sort of economic, this combination of pressure from the government and the economic problems that the media, particularly the print media, I mean, television is different. Television will be okay, I think, but the print media faces particular challenges. Um, and, and, you know, the, maybe the, the top brands will find a way out of it, but it, it's the kind of the, the mainstay of local and regional media which is going to struggle. But I thought, um, you know, Mukund, I just want to say one thing about this comparison between India and other countries in South Asia. I used to respond, I used to report in Sri Lanka, and it was very striking how under the Rajapaksa regime, how quickly these early signs of, of sort of government, other pressure on the press, how quickly the Sri Lankan media, which used to be you know, maybe not as spirited as the Indian media, but sort of reasonably free and diverse, how quickly that collapsed in the face of, of an, effectively an autocratic neo-authoritarian regime. And I mean, I was sort of stunned watching it as someone who'd never seen this happen in real time. And it, it made me, you know, increasingly alarmed about watching for the early signs of that happening anywhere else, whether that, and I think you can see bits and bobs of that happening here, and it, it you know, it'd sort of be worried about when it begins to happen, so. Okay. And um, I guess, uh, Priya, I was also uh, look, listening to your comments. Um, do you feel that, uh, you did talk about social media, and so the threat from that, is it just purely come from things like trolling or is it again, like I was in my, my previous question, is it something that we are sort of internalizing social media in a way, in the way we communicate and are we maybe focus more on sound bites and superficiality instead of the deeper analysis? Are we frustrated that we're unable to you know, get more meaty reports out of this government or any state government? Is Your that the issue? last point, sorry if I may interrupt, that is exactly yeah. what I was thinking about. It's not just the media under threat, it's also uh, the, the cabinet, cabinet ministers under threat, threat, the government, government functionaries under threat. Nobody wants to talk, nobody wants to say anything against the government. I remember covering the UPA, uh, there was a cabinet minister who used to go and he used to leave his cell phone on so we could actually hear what is happening in the cabinet meetings. The minute the cabinet meetings were over, we were given briefings by each and every cab uh, you know, source who was in the meeting, he used to brief us. That is not happening today. Today there is just a clampdown of information. It's a one-way traffic. We just get to know what is being put out on Twitter. There is no media advisor in the Prime Minister's office. We've had that debate, so I won't go into it. So the whole messaging is now one way, which is why a lot of this, uh, you know, journalism, uh, what we were saying, investigative journalism, people are not talking. So it's really your own initiative to go find out, and you really have to go through a lot more barriers than you did in the UPA time. So yes, part of the fact that this is a one-way Communication is because our sources are also feeling too scared to talk. But is there a difference again between the center and the state? Because again, like you know, in Tamil Nadu, we do have a, a rich tradition of investigating certain things, and cases have gone to the Supreme Court, and even a Supreme leader was convicted. So it goes on. So is there? I mean, is, there's a variance between center and state. Is my no, question? I, totally, I mean, absolutely, because, there is. And you know, uh, even Ravi spoke about you know the favors or the access uh, is more vital at the state level because, and also what is happening is also the model of media is also changing. We are also there's a lot of pressure to organize a lot of conclaves and sessions where you want to invite government, uh, you know, the uh, functionaries, prime ministers, and they will come only if you have a good rapport with them. My junior reporters in the uh, news ex they say, a you want us to attack the minister and abuse him, then, uh, or you know point out his faults tomorrow you want me to go to the same guy and say please come to my function he is not going to come so you know the news reporter also is constrained we're no longer just reporting we also become event organizers organizers so that is also a part of the problem i think uh, Ravi, a question for you so uh, is it also you you were talking a lot about journalists in almost you know sort of the moral corruption of their, their how they apply their not not all, certainly, but is that down to just the fact, the economics of it, that they are poorly paid, or is it more something, like I no, said, no, no, to no, do no, with no, the no. proprietors? I think, I think it's historical. 
uh, I am being uh, slightly politically incorrect. Now, the media we inherited after independence, let's just go back to the independence times, the leaders who opposed the British came from a particular class, which was westernized, had exposure to British political, social and parliamentarian uh, procedures and ethos, but were strong patriots. So the media who supported them inherited or belonged to the same class, more or less. The owners of the media, I mean media houses, many of them actually supported the freedom movement. So, I mean, it was like the journalist is a gentleman, like the officer is a gentleman. So as society changed, as politicians changed, as India became, leadership became less elitist, so did journalism. So today we are seeing a different kind of journalists because when I started in the, in, when I was in my twenties, there was a whole concept of the influential journalist. Today it's a powerful journalist. The influential journalist was someone who could actually influence somebody's mind, who would offer an ideal uh, opinion with responsibility. So he had a lot of respect. But the powerful journalist commands fear. Why? He can get a bureaucrat transferred, he can get a, you know, he can be the messenger who can you know, get some cabinet post done, who can actually sit down and negotiate with political parties or something. So essentially, I think it is a deterioration of overall society which is being reflected in journalism. But again, as I said, I mean, we are a very young country and, you know, we're finding our feet and I'm sure that we start wearing the right shoes again. True in a way, but I, I'm, I mean, this is a question, I guess, for any of you. Um, Young country perhaps, but I wonder about the character of our country as well because in a sense, you know, we, we, we do see this, the echo of this in other countries like we have Brexit, we have Trump, but even in India, you're left wondering with the kind of politics, the kind of uh, larger sense of public violence happening in public at different levels. Uh, are we fundamentally an extremely conservative culture and that's just coming to the fore after whatever, so many decades of independence or is this, is this a, a passing phase? Yeah, any, for any of you. If, and, you know, th that also tells us about media under threat. Uh, no, I don't think it's a passing phase. I think that it's a, it's a kind of a continuing phase from phase to phase. See, for example, it's a changing profile of the journalist, a changing profile of the editor or a senior journalist compared to uh, the, the profile of the guy who owns the media. Because today I, I see editors or journalists who are worth like 500 crore, who've got farmhouses and who've got like, you know, a land in uh, somewhere in Punjab. I mean, I, I say, what the hell? And like, I'm not paid enough to kind of buy a chota barsati somewhere in Delhi, damn it. And I know people have kind of worked with me owning, uh, you know, three farmhouses and, you know, God knows from where. And they paid maybe even less than I am. So, I think it's a, it's a whole change in the way the world has changed. I mean, if you want to buy a Cartier watch, why shouldn't I? So, if I can get the means to kind of buy it, what's it? I just plant a story. Yeah, but does that tie into the broader, I mean, we're tying in different th trends here, but does it tie into this sort of nativism, a sense of, you know, our own pride, our people, we need to stand up. Does this all go together? Because it's also a culture of, you know, I, I can do what I want to get ahead. That ties into what you said. And I guess I'm wondering, are we those people? Are we that people? No, I don't know. It's not just, uh, you know, see, this has been happening all along. It's not something new that every journalist, you know, some journalists take favors, some do not. So that's not a new thing. Why are we suddenly focusing on the media under threat right now at this point? That really is the big question. Yes, journal, I mean, I mean, I agree with part of what Ravi has said, but there is a larger problem here. Is it the fact, you know, as I was saying, uh, issues like uh, has the messaging of this government, it's like one way, and also this narrative of nationalism. I would really like to talk about how this label is also affecting the way we do our reporting. We cannot take a different side to a story. If we take a softer line on Kashmir, oh, you're peddling the separatist agenda. If we talk about the poor and Buster, you are a Maoist or you're an Axel, you know. So that narrative, the labels and social media helps and trolls help a lot in sticking those labels. That's why your earlier question on social media, social media is playing a huge role, a positive and a negative role. Positive role because it does give a voice to an alternative narrative, but the negative part is that you tend to become trolls, you're, you're abused, you're, you know, you're vilified, you're, and it's an organized system. We've heard about our machineries that are doing it. The Congress being in opposition maybe should have been more active. They were 
uh, as on most things, they were caught sleeping. The BJP has even taken the lead in terms of trolls also. But apparently, so, the Congress has its own troll army. Congress is catching up now. Yes, yeah. it is. Definitely. So, it's not a one-way thing. I would agree it is both ways, BJP and the Congress. But I think the BJP is ahead of the game. Or they had an earlier head start. Earlier start. I mean, I, I think... Oh, sorry. Um, well, I mean, I was just thinking that how when you were talking about the social media, you know, I think a lot of that also is um, responsibility of journalists themselves. Because when I look at the way uh, Trump is covered in America or in the media in general, uh, it's very like a celebrity profile. You know, you forget what the story is. No matter what the story is, it ends up just being about Trump. And you're no longer sure what the story was. That's why people don't really remember what Singapore summit was. You remember Kim Jong-un and you remember Trump, but you don't remember, was there a sanction stuff? Or is there, what was the agreement? The actual news gets lost, and that's often what happens in a celebrity profile. Like, if there was a story about Tom Cruise, you forget what the real story, the movie, who directed it, all of that gets lost. It's just a story about Tom Cruise and his hair and his clothing. So I feel like that's what journalism is turning into. And I think that's when corruptive governments really use that well. South Korea did it brilliantly. If you remember, there was Olympic last year. And the Olympic got lost in stories. All the journalists started covering North Korean cheerleaders at the Olympics. And actual sports news got lost. So it's a perfect example, I think, when, when journalists themselves lose the sight of the story and then they just want the rating, the clicks on the internet. Because if you put Kim Jong-un on the photograph and some flashy title, the people want to read it. But then they don't really care that there's no story. And that's, I think, journalist's job, really. James, I mean, I thought your point about, in a sense, is, India, is Indian media becoming more nativist is an interesting one. And one way to think about that is to try and keep your eye on like, what is structural and what is cyclical in all of this. So look at Republic, um, which for those of you who are not from India is, is kind of the Fox News of, of India, the most extreme, most vociferous uh, of the television channels, um, which is led by this guy, Arnab Goswami, who I profile in my book. His earlier incarnation was also shouty, but it was also, you know, it was... He was a, a little bit, he used to be a bit more liberal. Um, he made his name uh, during the, uh, or at least one of the incidents where he became most prominent were the attacks on the Taj Hotel and the, the sort of sense of the, the weakness of the Indian state, the anti-corruption movement. And I suspect, television being what it is, that when Mr. Modi becomes less popular and loses power, whether that happens in you know, a few months' time or later, that they will shift again, that this, what appears to be a structural shift, where all of these television channels are becoming exceptionally pro-BJP, will turn out to have been something that's rather cyclical. Social media is interesting from this regard, because, I mean, we spend a lot of time, all of us who are on India Twitter, whether you are an Indian on India Twitter or, or a kind of foreigner who happens to be sort of lurking there because they're interested in it. The phenomenon of the, the right-wing the right -wing kind of Modi supporters on Twitter is also very strong. But again, I suspect it's not clear that that is a sort of irreversible trend in Indian social media. When the BJP gets thrown out of power and is less popular, you'll probably find those voices are less prominent. But the structural effect of social media, the damage that it can cause on democratic discourse in general, which is far from unique to India, you know, look at Sri Lanka, look at Myanmar in particular, that's here to stay. And so I would keep your eyes on the real threat, which is the damage that social media can do to societies that have, you know, deep social divisions, but also where you do not have a strong tradition of public interest media. I mean, you know, social media has done a hell of a lot of damage in countries that do have a strong tradition of public interest media. That's the, that's the sort of structural problem. It's not clear to me that the BJP trolls are the real problem here. No, I, I just think that, you know, taking off from something she said, I think social media has allowed, I think it's, it's allowed people in power to reach out bypassing the traditional media. And I think this is the, related to the access issue. Uh, it's also allowed people to come to power. Uh, 
you know, look at Trump's victory. I mean, you know, he won despite uh, not having support in his own party. And we might forget this, but in 2014, on the run-up to 2014, all the little extremist, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, what is described in the press as a sort of fringe Parivar groups, um, uh, were no, no fans of Narendra Modi. They were, you know, the VHP was against him, uh, and the RSS was not back in the beginning. But he managed this, and I don't think, uh, though this is counterfactual and can never be proved, uh, I don't think he would have managed this without social media. So I think uh, many of these people that we are creating, um, you know, or we're voting to power in different parts of the world, Dutat, maybe in the Philippines, elsewhere, uh, it, they are sometimes social media led. The, 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 the issue, I think, which is interesting, and, you know, this is something close to my heart because I open Twitter every morning just to check who has abused us. And that's, you know, there every day, you know, being called a Naxal tabloid and, and stuff like that. But um, is, is whether this, uh, it is only a, ref the social media is only a reflection of this polarization which is out there, uh, which is what we presume, or whether as, uh, you know, some academics are now beginning to uh, write and suggest and argue, uh, like Cass Sunstein in The Republic, and, and there's also another tech guy, not an academic, but he's written a book on 10 reasons to delete your social media account, that look, this is not a reflection, it's being caused by this, that the algorithms in social media are actually fostering, encouraging, and creating this kind of polarization. They're locking us into echo chambers, they're preventing us from carrying out conversations with each other, they're actually generating anger, sadness, hate, all of it. And I think this is something that we need to watch, I think, going forward. Uh, what social media is, and social media is, is not an isolated animal out there. It's actually affecting the way traditional media works. And to me, this is very worrying, because you now have, you know, software that's running in many uh, newspaper, uh, new, I mean, newsrooms, uh, you know, saying these are the top trending uh, stories on Twitter. And, uh, you know, uh, and I think it would be fair to say that no news editor is, is completely, uh, you know, blind to what is happening out there, even if he's not totally influenced by it. So we are, we are being led, um, and we are in danger of being led by another animal and, and, and not a very nice one. Uh, so that's... Uh, Okay, uh, one final question to Ravi, after which we'll throw it open to questions from the audience. Uh, so do you think, Ravi, that as a response to this change in the environment, um, the, the di digitization and digital media, do you think that um, you, you know, the, the mainstream media itself is changing shape, going into more, say, online forms, like we have scrolled Scroll and way, yeah. other, what's yeah. that impact? Yeah, I think, I think that's really a hope. You know, I think it's a counter to the threat of the social media because many of it is crowdfunded. It's crowdfunded. Some of it, of course, are offshoots of, uh, offshoots of uh, main newspapers, but you have independently funded uh, dot-com news portals, whatever the, the political stand they be, many of them are anti modi But the fact of the matter is that they are able to negotiate a position with the audience much better than uh, other media houses, which are forced to depend on government advertising, corporate advertising, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of posted, but again, the fact of the matter is that the bug stops with the editor. I mean, it stops with the editor. I mean, Priya an editor, Moko, and all of us. And uh, again, it is you know what an editor does with news. And, and I am not a great you know big picture guy. Okay, I mean, at least when I talk about things. I mean, again, getting back to my, I can only talk from my personal experiences. Um, it is a diversion. I remember when in the, day, the first week we decided to go weekly and uh, we didn't have a cover and as usual Arun changed it to something and I think we decided to go with Sitaram Kesti on the cover. So, Sitaram Kesti was not taking Prabhu Chalas calls. So we found that uh, you know, he was in uh, a CWC meeting. So Prabhu, Prabhu tells me, let's, let's, go, let's go to this thing and he calls Prabhu Singh who is the photo editor. We go to the CWC, I mean Akbar Road and Prabhu actually crashes the CWC meeting. He says, yeah, enough, enough, let's all go out and take a photo shoot. Okay. Now, that was the power of a weekly 
uh, which is print media. And I'm sure Times of India and all of us, you know, have you know, been able to do it. But today the dot com guys are going to be the guys who will have that kind of power. And they will have that. And you will have the mainstream media following the dot com stories. Because that's where it's out there. Except that are the dot coms making money, I guess. I have no clue. But they're paying well. <laughs> they are paying well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. On that note, um, we'll open the house to questions. Uh, please keep your questions brief and uh, no, no, avoid comments. Thank you. Yeah, my, uh, my question would be to uh, Priya Sahigal. Uh, my, my question is, is not the media, the, the threat to the media from within? I ask this because in India today, there are literally hundreds of news channels 24 by 7. And everybody is uh, trying to sensationalize news create issues. If I put on an Indian news channel, I, I only hear cacophony. You know, and it, it's so loud, it's irritating. And the, the shocking thing in India is that a news presenter doesn't present news, they give opinions. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I think that's a whole new threat to the media, the threat from within. The anchors have become the news, views have become news, and noise has become news. I think that's why at NewsX, if I may plug my own channel, our ch tagline is news, not noise. So we are hoping to cut that through that. Just two very brief questions, uh, things that happen in other countries. One in my own, in Germany, in the magazine, in the magazine Der Spiegel, they have just um, had a scandal where one of the young award-winning journalists uh, wrote all fake stories and they are they're really shocked about that, so could that happen also in India? And the other one is about Brazil, where um, in German journalism at least, I read that he basically uh, won his uh, campaign through uh, a very intelligent use of WhatsApp groups, which has not been mentioned here. I wonder if these two things play a certain role in Asia and India as well. I think, I mean, uh, the first case was one where he was faking all of his stories and then his partner, the, his teammate journalist actually began to notice that and then he dug further and it was revealed the extent of which. Uh, sort of points to, in a sense, uh, the, the elements of fact-checking. I don't know, if, do you feel we have a, a good history of fact-checking in India or is it like the Wild West and anything? Do what you want. Enormous. Enormous team of fact checkers. In fact, uh, yes. Yeah. Obviously, escaped them. Yeah. Hello, 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 sir. Okay. Next question. Hi. Uh, so recently, the re uh, whole world was shook by the horrific assassination of uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And the sad part is that the alleged uh, perpetrator behind this killing is walking free. So, like, have uh, grave threats like these propel journalists to soften their views and censor themselves? I like uh, to know the opinions of uh, Suki Kim and Mukund. Sorry, this, this is about uh, the, the, yeah. I mean, we've had murders here. Look at what happened to Gauri Lankesh. I mean, which uh, everybody knows about, but. You know, if you look at the stats, uh, I was reading about the number of people in the, in the Northeast who've routinely been killed and uh, barely get a mention. I'm, and I'm sure this is true of many of the journalists sitting here. Most of us wouldn't be able to remember even three or four of their names. It has been routine. It's been happening over the years. Uh, just It was just, uh, I think, last year that Annette, the editor in Shillong, Patrick Mukum, was shot in the stomach. And, uh, you know, she survived and I, sorry? No, Patricia was shot in the stomach. Patricia Mukherjee was, yeah. Is it not a fireball? Oh. Okay, sorry, I take that back. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh, she was, a, a bomb was thrown in her house. So I think this routinely happens in, in, in places and I think, uh, you know, I think in this climate of intolerance, it's, it's likely to happen more and more. I, I, I see this as a problem. The, yeah. I mean, the Khashoggi uh, uh, tragedy that was um, reported constantly in America and was kept in the news uh, just nonstop. And well, that's because it's, it's really related to Trump in many ways and, and Saudi Arabia and the United States. 
But more than that, what I found really amazing about that was that the one who kept it in the news was his editor at Washington Post, who was just relentless. She went and just would be interviewed by every single station to try to get the news out there. And her effort was amazing, and I was thinking watching it how a one person can make a difference. Other people were covering it, but her passion for the subject and, and fight for injustice of this was um, remarkable. So I did, huh? Was Karen? At, yeah, yeah, she was actually my editor. I think used to write for her. Yeah, she was, uh, yeah, right. She, like was she, she, said she was his editor for the Global Opinion section. And I think that her effort actually made some difference in keeping it in the news. And so I think that's, it comes back to your former question about uh, things happening in Asia or um, the, the fake news that was, that was a scandal in Germany. Um, I think that another side of that is the individuals that can make a difference. For example, in South Korea, if you remember, there was an impeachment of a president that happened in 2016. And uh, because of so many people came out to protest, millions and millions that came out to protest, it actually led to the removal of the president. And what actually caused that was the independent journalism. And because what you were saying that we can actually bypass the media to go directly to social media, there was a lot of independent journalism that happened. And Korea is the most wired nation in the world, South Korea. Everybody's on high-speed internet. What that means is you have a platform. So really young journalists started creating podcasts around the clock on what's happening and also verifying it on the news of things that are happening real time with their iPhone. And all of that, I think, created exciting new sort of journalism that made a real difference. So I think that's an upside to the social media. Yeah, that's great. That the downside also is a lot of people, are, are journalists are themselves, seem more concerned about their their sort of Twitter following and their tweets rather than what they file for their publications. So I think that's a downside. Two sides of the coin. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, more comments. Yeah. I mean, on this, you know, this is, what is happening is the rise of the personality cult. Uh, the, you know, the faceless anchor is no longer faceless. He is a personality. So now he's not called you to hear your views. He wants to express his views. You are just a window on the he's channel. The news. Yeah, he is the news. He is the views. And that, I think, though I see a return to normalcy happening, I hope sooner rather than later, but people are getting tired. How many people who watch On Urban Times now are now watching him on Republic? People are getting a little bit tired, I think. I hope. Uh, see, there's a, there's, a, there's a new wave of journalism that we're seeing in the last two years, which is, uh, you know, investigative journalism that is online, which is print and on scroll. Um, it's a great form of news which, uh, which is actually helping us know what the truth is from the chaff. Uh, but what, uh, and they're able to bypass the corporate heads uh, of the various uh, media uh, companies. Uh, what I fear is that as these, these uh, independent journalists also may go through the editor's scissors to ensure that uh, they're politically correct, to ensure they don't get uh, you know, a legal notice just like uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Crabtree did. Uh, do you think it is wise that you have like a journalist charter where you have a public litigation at, you know, where you guys, uh, the journalists' uh, intentions are safeguarded uh, from all these contempts, all these articles that are, uh, you know, that uh, all these corporate companies can throw against you? I, I'm not sure about a journalist charter. That sounds like a good idea. One thing I would say, so I used to be a big optimist for the role of new entry publications. And so I'm a big admirer of The Wire and Scroll and this sort of new generation of, of publications who are you know, scrappy and fearless and do, do great work. Um, nonetheless, if you want to have really high quality investigative journalism, it's hard to do that in what is effectively a start startup run on a shoestring. You know, the reason why the New York Times is one of the world's greatest media organizations is it has lots of journalists who are paid reasonably well, um, you know, who are senior, who are experienced, who are given a lot of space and time to do the kind of investigative journalism that is revealing problems in the Trump administration. Um, the British tradition where I come from doesn't have, the investigative journalism isn't as good as that. Um, and in the end, if what you put your hope on is a few scrappy startups 
but not the mainstream, then that isn't the position that you want to be in. You, know, you want your mainstream, particularly print, but also broadcast institutions, to be doing that work too. It isn't going to be enough simply to have a few kind of young, hungry startups staffed by 20-somethings, or at least I, I'm skeptical that that will get you where you want to go. Except independent journalism doesn't always mean that. I mean, I think that in a country like South Korea, where a lot of uh, established uh, seasoned journalists kept getting fired because of the government, corrupt government. So it's actually was being started by fired journalists <laughs> who had years and years of experience with some young people. So I think that there's a different way that one can approach independent journalism, but the social media does allow that the way it didn't before. Uh, no, but beyond that, it's not basic principle social media, not just corruption, 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 corruption. You know, why shouldn't journalists declare their assets? You know, I mean, I've known Priya for a long time. She has tremendous access. She's not corrupt. She doesn't use her access to kind of to make money. I know so many journalists like that, but so many don't. So dot com or not dot com, this basic principle, are you corrupt, are you not corrupt? You have to, why can't you, you know, why can't you put an asset saying these are my assets? They don't. I mean, if you've got to say the, the politicians have to do it, or so and so, why not a journalist? Okay, great. I think we're out of time. One last question, please. Okay. Okay, some of our uh, main uh, English uh, channels in uh, India, you know, I find them saying, like we were the first one to get access to this document, first one to bring out this story. Can you justify the need for it in terms of survival or competitiveness, please? Anyone? All to do with the cult of the anchor. He's no longer faceless. He's a personality. He or she is first with the news. He had the largest number of Twitter followers. I got it right. You know, even when the, uh, uh, you see them quoting their predictions on various days, they also soothsayers. They are, you know, they're first with the documents. It's all to do with the personality cult. It's not just in politics. Even journalists have the same problem. Yeah, just a small, just a small question. Uh, do you okay, absolute last one? Yeah, yeah, just a short. Do you think the 24/7 concept? has corrupted the media. It has affected the media the most because they fill in contents. They don't have contents, they make contents. They get news. Priya, you want to take that again? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wonder whether I can briefly comment on the earlier question. Um, you know, I think that the, uh, I mean, we talk of a brave new journalism and, you know, online journalism and so on. But I think it's worth asking what free digital journalism, whether it's done by a mainstream media house or whether it's done by an independent, is doing to the very practice of journalism. And uh, we have, I think, collapsed the distinction between news and opinion, which is now happening in television channels. It's now seen as very dowdy and old-fashioned to, to make the separation. Uh, and I think there's a reason for this. Uh, the, the reason for this is if, if you make all your investments upfront and then you provide a product that is essentially free, the principal question that will manifest itself in your mind is how many more eyeballs do I get? And if that's the question that's going to come to you in a free website, you will by nature, I mean, by, I think by, just by compulsion, uh, do all the wrong things that affect the very practice of journalism. Uh, one could be sourcing, the other could be just speed. You want to be a little faster, so you, you know, Google picks you up before. You want to be more sensationalistic. I mean, if you're so that way disposed, you might more have, may have more legs and cleavage. You write headlines which have no bearing to the story. And that is beginning to happen. And this, what is happening in this online space, is being, beginning to affect newspapers as well. And it's happening, you know, with in, 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 in the U.S. as well. I mean, we, we may all have very good reasons to dislike Donald Trump, but I think the mainstream American media, uh, in the mainstream American media, the distinction between news and opinion on, on their front pages is, is, has vanished almost. And, and it's, 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 it's likely to vanish here. So we may, may all start because of this, this free digital online uh, media space, we might all have to start shouting a little louder to get noticed. And I think that's what's happening. And I think apart from everything else, this is, I think, a danger to the very practice of journalism itself. Okay, thank you. And on that thoughtful note, we'll wrap up because we're beyond time. Thanks so much. Thank you to my panelists as well.
I, I thank the panel members for such an engaging session. And with that, we come to an end to day two of the Hindu Lit for Life here at the showplace. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. In association with NewSex, associate sponsors, VR Mall Chennai, Fresh Food Partners, ID Foods, Session Sponsor, United India Insurance, Bookstore Partner, Higginbotham's, Water Partner, Archie Water, Wi-Fi Partner, ACT, Radio Partner, Fever FM, brought to you by Theme.